And I confessed to him that I killed Angela and the kids. And what they want him to do is they want him to make a tape. I wasn't even in the state of Missouri when these murders took place. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I, I, not only did I not commit the crime, he's like, no, nah, no. Nah. He says, later on, he says, they take him out in the back of the Jenny station. Jenny's police pull him over. They call, they call the dispatch and find out that he's in Missouri. Take him to Jennings police station. They hold him there for 13 hours. Leonard Raheem Taylor was convicted and sentenced to his end for allegedly slaying his girlfriend, Angela Rowe, and her three children in St. Louis in 2004. Taylor, who denied the charges until his end, was captured on camera, passing through security at St. Louis Lambert International Airport on the morning of November 26, 2004. The state argued that Taylor's trip was evidence that he was attempting to escape the crime scene. However, Taylor claimed that the trip was for business and to meet his 13-year-old daughter, whom he had never seen before. Taylor even called Roe while he was visiting his daughter, and both Deja and her mother confirmed that Roe and her children were alive during the conversation. Despite this discrepancy, Taylor was arrested two weeks later and charged with four counts of first-degree slaying. He was ultimately convicted and sentenced to his end. However, the case is not without its complexities, and some people believe that Taylor is innocent. The prosecution's case was largely based on circumstantial evidence and there were no eyewitnesses or physical evidence linking Taylor to the slayings. Let's check out the whole story. Never been locked up for anything, never been, had no kind of conviction or anything like that in the medical field. Plus he was a, a they call him preacher, he was a, a deacon at the church and everything. No criminal record. He said, my daughter played with them children the oldest girl was 11 years old, Alexa. He says, and I seen a male at the house. The scene. The family of Angela Rowe became concerned when they had not heard from her in several days by Friday, December 3rd. Her sister, Jerjuan, tried to reach out to her children's school, but was informed that they had not been there all week, which was an unusual thing as the children never missed school. The police were then called to Rose House in Jennings, a suburb of St. Louis around 6 p.m. Upon arriving, they discovered a shocking and horrifying scene. Rose's three children, Alexis of 10 years old, Akrea, 6 years old, and Tyrese, 5 years old, were found fully dressed and lying on the bed in the back bedroom, each with a gunshot wound to the head. In the same room, a television was turned up loudly. In the front bedroom, Rose was found under a blanket with a gunshot wound to the head as well. The air conditioning was set up to 50 degrees and Joseph Lebb from the medical examiner's office noted that Rose's body was in rigor mortis and her core body temperature was just above 51 degrees. He also observed early signs of decomposition. Gurjuan informed Lebb that she had last seen Roe on Saturday, November 27th, when Roe had come over to lend her $50. On the morning after the bodies of Angela Roe and her three children were discovered in their Jennings home, Medical examiner Philip Birch conducted autopsies on the victims. Based on the conditions of the bodies, Birch estimated that they had been slain between one day and one week prior to their discovery. He believed that the family had likely perished during the week of November 29th. Leonard Taylor, Rowe's live-in boyfriend, quickly became the main suspect in the case. Gurjuan, Rowe's older sister, asked the police whether Taylor was inside the house when the bodies were found, and various members of Rowe's family told the police that her relationship with Taylor had not been without difficulties. Taylor had a criminal record and a history of violence. He had served time in California for physical exploitation and was accused of physically exploiting his 16-year-old stepdaughter in 2000. Additionally, he was a seasoned drug dealer who trafficked cocaine across the country using a variety of aliases and fraudulent IDs. However, the state failed to provide a clear motive for the slayings. Taylor was involved in multiple intimate relationships that followed the same pattern as his illicit business dealings, leading to his nickname Cass, short for Casanova. While he was involved with Roe, he also had a wife in California and a girlfriend in Kentucky. One of Taylor's former partners was Mia Perry, Deja's mother. They became involved in the late 1980s and in 1991, the same year Deja was born, Taylor was arrested for drug dealing and sentenced to time in federal prison. He never got to meet his baby daughter. While in prison, Taylor got involved in corporate check fraud. 
After his release, he briefly dabbled in white-collar crime, which landed him in Missouri State Prison. Roe was the younger sister of Taylor's former neighbor in St. Louis. She visited Taylor often while he was incarcerated. When he was released in 2002, Taylor resumed his cross-country drug trade, staying with Roe when he was in town. In the summer of 2004, Taylor, Roe, and her children moved into the house in Jennings. Roe had Taylor's name tattooed on her arm, and there were pictures of the smiling couple and love notes that Roe had written around the house. The move was a relief for Taylor because he had recently had a drug deal go wrong with the Gangster Disciples, a notorious violent gang operating in St. Louis and Southern Illinois. Meanwhile, he had also received a lead on his long-lost daughter, Deja, whom he tracked down in California just days after Thanksgiving. During their reunion, Taylor called back home to St. Louis to share the news with Roe. He planned to bring Deja to St. Louis to meet Roe and 10-year-old Alexis. The following Monday, Taylor boarded a Greyhound bus carrying a kilo of cocaine and headed back east on business, as he told the Kansas City Star. On December 9th, he was arrested in Kentucky for the slayings of Roe and her children. He's like, nah, nah. He says, later on, he says, they take him out in the back of the Jenny station. They tell him that they believe that I committed these murders. We got into it. She come at me and stabbed me with a knife. Jenny's police pull him over. They call, they call the dispatch and find out that he's in Missouri. Beat him up put gun in his mouth, tell him, listen, you're a truck driver. The children witnessed it, so I murdered them, stating that I called him on November the 22nd now. Take him to Jennings Police Station. They hold him there for 13 hours. We can make it where you can be found dead in your truck. And I confessed to him that I killed Angela and the kids. I couldn't get her off of me so I shot her. And what they want him to do is, they want him to make a tape. Diving into the investigation. Perry Taylor received a phone call from a St. Louis police detective eight hours after the bodies of Catherine Kathy Rowe and her three children were discovered on December 3rd. At the time, Perry was spending the night south of Atlanta. It is unclear from the record whether the police were the first to inform him that Rowe and her children had been shot fatally. However, a detective asked Perry if he knew where his younger brother was, which he did not know. Police later tracked down Perry at a truck shop on the New Jersey Turnpike. They took him to a local police station where they asked him again when he last spoke to his brother. Perry recalled his brother had called about a rap show in Alabama, but detectives said they had records that showed otherwise. They also asked if Taylor had a gun. Perry said it wouldn't surprise him given his brother's lifestyle. Four days after the bodies were discovered, Taylor was found hiding in the floorboard of a car after leaving another girlfriend's home in Kentucky. He was arrested. Taylor always maintained his innocence, arguing that police fixated on him as a suspect and ignored a compelling alibi supported by witness statements in favor of a theory in which he slaughtered his loved ones and then stayed at the crime scene for days before flying to California. During the trial, it was proven that blood from Taylor's sunglasses and car was consistent with Rose's DNA profile. A witness testified that they saw Taylor discard the possible weapon used at the scene, which matched the caliber of the bullets used in the slings. The same caliber bullets were also later found in Taylor's car. So while some facts didn't line up, others did. At trial, prosecutors rolled back the clock, leaning into Perry's videotaped statement and arguing that Taylor slaughtered Roe and the children in the wee hours of November 24th, then remained in the house until he flew to California on the morning of November 26th. In pressing this alternate timeline, the state had a strong ally, medical examiner Philip Birch. Birch had previously said that the most likely time of demise was within days of the bodies being found on December 3rd, and no more than a week beforehand. A window that would exclude Taylor. But at trial, Birch changed his story claiming that he hadn't taken into account the air conditioner being set to 50 degrees. With that in mind, he testified that Roe and the children could have been destroyed up to three weeks before they were found. At trial, the state's primary evidence against Taylor was Perry's videotape statements. Perry was asked again when he last talked to his brother, and he said, The last time I spoke with him was the night he told me he did that. In a pre-trial deposition three years later, 
Perry angrily insisted that he had been coerced into giving the statements against his brother. Perry recalled the cops threatening that if he didn't say what they wanted, they would hurt his mother. Nevertheless, one year later, Perry's videotaped statements would become the state's primary evidence against Taylor at the trial. Taylor's innocence claims were turned aside time and again. Though he continued saying he was innocent, Missouri Governor Mike Parson said the facts of his guilt in the slayings have been proven. Parson said despite his self-serving claim of innocence, the facts of his guilt in the gruesome quadruple homicide remain. The state of Missouri will carry out Taylor's sentences according to the court's order and delivers justice for the four innocent lives he stole. All of Taylor's appeals were denied, leaving open a host of unanswered questions and doubts about his guilt. His efforts to avail himself of a Missouri law that allowed prosecutors to reopen possible wrongful convictions were rebuffed by St. Louis County prosecuting attorney Wesley Bell. I wasn't even in the state of Missouri when these murders took place. One, like I said, there was no motive. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I, I, not only did I not commit the crime, you know, I had no reason to commit the crime. Last moments. Taylor was punished by means of lethal injection, and he issued a final written statement before his demise. His statement included a quote from the Quran, urging believers to seek patience and prayer from Allah, who is with those who are patient. He also emphasized the Islamic belief that those who die in Allah's way are not truly gone, but live on in the hearts of their loved ones. Taylor added the extinction is not an enemy, but rather a destiny that all must face, and encouraged others to look forward to meeting it. Finally, he expressed his wish for peace. The punishment took place at the state prison in Bonaterre, and Taylor was the third misery inmate to be fatally punished in the past few months. According to reports, Taylor's feet kicked at the lethal dose of pentobarbital was administered, and he took several deep breaths before all movement ceased. That's all for today, folks. See you next time.